الحمد لله ثم الحمد لله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله All thanks and all praise are to God the one I bear witness that there is none but him and that Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is his prophet and his messenger I would like to continue taking advantage of the hiatus in our traditional Juma prayers to use the PowerPoint format to discuss some topics that PowerPoint is particularly suited for and may be harder to fully bring across with our traditional khutbah format. And today's khutbah is titled Partisanship and Islamic Perspective. And I mean here mostly political partisanship. And I would like to begin by telling you what inspired this khutbah. In part, of course, we have important elections around the corner. But mostly, it was watching an interview where a foreign journalist asked an American correspondent, so what do you make of the tribalism which has now gripped your nation? And honestly, the use of that word tribalism hurt. And then I read an article about the end of American exceptionalism. The article was extremely well written, very powerful, and one line in particular caught my attention, where the author, who was a foreign author, was saying that over the decades, the United States has inspired a variety of feelings across the world, ranging from admiration to rage but it has never before inspired pity. And so I felt that I should talk about this topic, but let me be very clear up front. This is not a partisan khutbah. This is not a pro-Republican khutbah. It is not a pro-Democrat khutbah. This is a khutbah, yes, about a political topic, but from the perspective that as American Muslims, we believe that our faith extends beyond worship. Of course, it includes worship, which is a critical part of the faith, but that our value system applies to our private life, to our public life. The same set of values governs how we deal with our family, how we live our business life, how we live our political life. And one of the genuine issues in our country now is partisanship. I realize, of course, that my voice is almost meaningless in the din of voices already speaking out about a variety of things. But at the very least, I would like to clear my conscience. We know the hadith of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Man ra'a minkum munkaran falyugayirhu biyadih fa in lam yastata' fa bi lisanih fa in lam yastata' fa bi qalbihi wa thalika adha'afu al-iman. This is on the authority of the companion Abu Sa'id al-Khudri who said, I heard the messenger of Allah say, whoever of you sees an evil, let him change it with his hand and if he is not able to do so, then let him change it with his tongue. And he, if he is not able to do so, then with his heart. And that is the weakest of faith. So I would like at the very least to speak out and for my heart to bear witness to what I believe is the truth and God knows best. Just a very cursory internet search will show you the number of articles that are now being written about the harm that partisanship in the political process, or as that foreign journalist said, tribalism, is causing to our nation. Hyperpartisanship could destroy U.S. democracy. Hyperpartisanship is destroying Western democracies. The two-party system broke the Constitution. The disunited states, how partisan politics is polarizing the political process and so on. And anyone who is listening to the news, and I don't listen to much news, will know the devastating harm 
that loyalty to a political party above loyalty to the nation causes to democracy. We have seen the gridlock. We have seen the paralysis that has gripped Washington. We have seen the overt hypocrisy that is now occurring when people support their party over and above the interests of their country. And this is not a problem unique to the United States, but for us as an American Muslim community, it is an issue both on the American side and on the Muslim side that we should address directly. Many authors have written about how partisanship has been increasing, how polarization is now the norm in our country. And if you look at this diagram from Congress in the early 50s to Congress in 2011 to 2013, let alone now, this picture alone tells the story. The blue dots are the Democrats, the red dots are the Republicans, and the lines connecting them are the times that they voted together on issues and resolutions before Congress. You see that in the late 40s and early 50s, yes, there were distinct camps, but they very, very often voted together on the same issue. They saw eye to eye. When we get to 2011, you see that the two groups have become essentially isolated and polarized with the exception of a very few Democrats, a very few blue dots who were willing to vote with Republicans on some issues. And this is in 2011, let alone in 2020. So there is no doubt that polarization or tribalism and loyalty to the party above everything else has now become the norm in our political process. Let me try to make the point another way. I know this is a bit of a busy slide, but we'll walk through it together. And this is about voting record versus predicted voting record. And it is from the point of view of the current majority Republican administration. And in a nutshell, the point of the slide is that if we are truly living in a representative democracy, then our elected officials need to be voting in a way to reflect the will of the people. So let us, for example, look at the first senator, Republican from Florida, the first line on this list. They voted with the Republican administration 92.1% of the time. However, based on election results in favor of the majority party in their state, their predicted vote with the Republican administration should have only been 43.5% of the time. So in the over under column, you see that they have overvoted in favor of the Republican administration 48.6% of the time. Now let's go to the bottom of the list, the Democratic Senator from Montana. Their vote with the Republican administration was only 30.9% of the time. But based on election results in their state, they would have been expected to vote with the administration 82.6% of the time and so they undervoted by nearly 52% of the time. So what is this telling us? It is telling us that our representative democracy is broken. Our elected officials are voting along party lines instead of reflecting the will of their constituency. For those of you interested in delving a little bit more into this, let me recommend to you this book by Thomas Mann and Norman Ornstein. They are two of the leading political commentators and analysts in our nation with a very long history of covering 
the congressional process. And the title says it all. It's even worse than it looks or it's even worse than it was. And here's a blurb about the book where they're saying that acrimony and hyperpartisanship have seeped into every part of the political process. Congress is deadlocked and its approval ratings are at record lows. America's two main political parties have given up their traditions of compromise, endangering our very system of constitutional democracy. And I would like to note that the founding fathers of this nation, and this is a direct quote from this website that you see, uh, history.com, the founding fathers feared political factions would tear the nation apart. That's the title of an article that they have on their website, and this is a respected historical source. And in that article, they note that at the time of the Constitutional Convention, the Founding Fathers specifically and deliberately omitted political parties from the, the Constitution that they were drawing up for this nation. And the article makes it very clear that they very deliberately wanted to avoid the divisions that they had seen in England from political parties. They didn't call them political parties. They, in fact, called them factions. And they saw them as corrupt relics of the British monarchy, and they wanted to do away with them in favor of a truly democratic government. So, for example, Alexander Hamilton called political parties, quote, the most fatal disease of popular governments. And by popular, popular here, he means governments of the people, true democracies. And James Madison, who worked with Hamilton to defend the Constitution to the public, wrote in one of his Federalist papers that one of the functions of a, quote, well-constructed union would be its, quote, tendency to break and control the violence of faction. And faction here means political parties and the hyper-partisanship that we now see undermining the very fabric of our democracy. My dear brothers and sisters, we need to understand that democracies are fragile. That is why there are so few of them in the world. That is why the Quran enjoins upon us shura, that the will of the people needs to count. And that is why when shura was mentioned as one part of one verse, the companions saw it as so important that they named that surah, Surah to Shura. Yes, this experiment is far from perfect. We have seen it, we have lived it, particularly in the area of civil rights where there have been devastating failures. And yet, this system, I believe, of the world's modern forms of government holds the best hope for progressively improving and correcting those ills. And partisanship now seems to be threatening that potential and that promise. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us to the right path, to that which pleases Him. And we pray for ourselves and we pray for our nation. Udu Allah. Alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah, ashadu an la ilaha illallah. We as Muslims should be particularly sensitive to this issue of factionalism and tribalism because it significantly harmed the very beautiful experiment and success that the Prophet, peace be upon him, brought to the Arabian Peninsula. Within only 25 years of his death, the Muslims had divided into factions. 
those for Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu and those for Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. And first they fought the battle of Al-Jamal and then they fought the battle of Sufin. And if you look at this slide, the commanders and the leaders of the two armies, you see the list of who is who among the companions of the Prophet lining up against each other in armies that were nearly a hundred thousand people apiece and you see the casualties and the losses of Muslims killing Muslims because of their loyalty to a particular leader or a particular ideology over and above the instructions of the Quran in Namal Mu'minuna Ikhwa that the believers are nothing but brethren and yet hyperpartisanship caused the battle of Safin where nearly 70,000 people died. So we know firsthand the harms of hyperpartisanship and we know that this has never left our Ummah and even when the Ummah was divided now into modern nation states within each and every Islamic country there is the same hyperpartisanship. Now I titled this khutbah Political Partisanship and Islamic Perspective. For the Islamic perspective I would like to bring in the example of Ali ibn al Hussein Zain al Abidin. This is Ali the son of the grandson of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He is the son of Al Hussein, who was the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib, who married Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Ali ibn Al Hussein Zain al Abidin was, by all reports, a truly pious man. His nickname was As Sajjad the one who frequently was in prostration and sujood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the man that it was said of him that after he died in al Madina, they experienced the disappearance of Sadaqatul Sir. Sadaqatul Sir means the secret charity. Families would wake up to find sacks of food and money at their doorstep. They didn't know from whence it came. And it was only when Ali Zain al Abidin died and this secret charity stopped that they realized that it was Ali ibn al Hussein who had been giving them the money. And this is a man who was known to frequently weep. And when he was asked, Why do you cry so much? he said, Do not blame me. Said Yaqub. nearly cried himself blind when two of his sons went missing. I saw 14 of my family slaughtered before my eyes and he was referring to the incident of Karbala where he saw his father, his brother, his uncle and many other members of his family killed in front of him. He was too ill to participate in the battle, so he was not killed. Later, he was brought before the Umayyad Caliph who was going to kill him, and it was only the intercession of his aunt that saved him on that occasion, and he was returned to Al-Madina. The history books report that in his 50s, he died and died by poisoning at the hands of the Umayyads. So if anyone has a reason for bitterness and partisanship, it would be Ali Zainul Abidin. Now history reports that during a pilgrimage season, a group of Muslims came to him from Iraq and they of course were on the side of Ali ibn Abi Talib. They were a group of the Shiite Muslims, the ones who strongly took the side of Ali. And again, I am not being partisan here. I am someone 
who when I was 15 was asked, are you Shi'i or Sunni? And I didn't know, because in my household, that was never an issue. But this group came and sat with him and started talking about Abu Bakr and about Umar ibn al-Khattab and about Uthman ibn Affan and insulting them viciously. And so Ali, Zain al-Abideen, who as I said would have every reason to have been bitter and partisan, he replied to them with the verses of Surah al-Hash and he asked them, he quoted to them verse 8, he said, tell me are you from this group? And the verse says, لِلْفُقَرَاءِ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ الَّذِينَ أُخْرِجُوا مِنْ دِيَارِهِمْ وَأَمْوَالِهِمْ يَبْتَغُونَ فَضْلًا مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرِضْوَانًا وَيَنْصُرُونَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ أُولَئِكَ هُمُ الصَّادِقُونَ This is the verse that is talking about the piety and the sacrifice and the standing of the muhajireen for the poor immigrants who were expelled from their homes and their properties seeking bounty from Allah and his approval and supporting Allah and his messenger there is a share those are the truthful so he said are you from among this group and they said no because of course they were not from the early muhajireen he then asked them using the next verse if they were from the ansar from the true faithful of al Madina, who converted to Islam early and supported those poor immigrants who were coming from Mecca, the Muhajirun, by sharing with them their wealth and opening to them their homes. And the verse says, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَالَّذِينَ تَبَوَّأُوا الدَّارَ وَالْإِيمَانَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ يُحِبُّونَ مَنْ هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِمْ وَلَا يَجِدُونَ فِي صُدُورِهِمْ حَاجَةً مِمَّا أُوتُوا وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصَةً وَمَنْ يُوْخَ شُحَّ نَفْسِهِ فَأُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ And also for those who were settled in Al-Madina and adopted the faith before them. They love those who emigrated to them and find not any want in their breasts of what the immigrants were given, but give them preference over themselves, even though they are in privation. And whoever is protected from the stinginess of his soul, it is those who will be successful. So Ali Zain al Abidin asked the people that were talking to him and talking down Abu Bakr and Omar and Uthman radiallahu anhum said, are you from this group? Were you from those early Ansar that the Quran praises? And they said, no, we are not. So he said to them, by your own admission, you are not from those two groups. And then he looked at them and said, and I will bear witness that you are not from the third group. And he quoted the next verse of Surah Al-Hashr. وَالَّذِينَ جَاءُوا مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لَنَا وَلِإِخْوَانِنَا الَّذِينَ سَبَقُونَا بِالْإِيمَانِ وَلَا تَجْعَلْ فِي قُلُوبِنَا غِلًّا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا رَبَّنَا إِنَّكَ رَؤُوفٌ رَحِيمٌ And there is a share for those who came after them saying, Our Lord, forgive us and our brothers who preceded us in faith, and put not in our hearts any resentment toward those who have believed our Lord indeed you are kind and merciful and so Ali Zain al Abidin told them I bear witness against you that you are not of this group you're not the ones who came later having love for people of faith asking God to forgive them for their mistakes asking God to remove any resentment in our hearts against them and then he said to them you are not true Muslims, you are just dressed in the garb of Islam, get up and leave me. And this is the Islamic attitude toward partisanship. From the man who would have every reason to have been partisan and to have been bitter and to have been angry, yet his faith was such that he overcame that. Loyalty needs to be to the truth, not to party, not to affiliation, not to sectarian ideology. 
So really, in a nutshell, it boils down to this. Verse 135 from Surah An-Nisa is giving us the cure to the ills of partisanship. And it is not a verse just about our own individual behavior, but it should also be a verse about our system of governance, about the behavior of our elected officials. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كونوا قوامين بالقسط شهداء لله شهداء لله ولو على أنفسكم أو الوالدين والأقربين إن يكن غنيا أو فقيرا فالله أولى بهما فلا تتبعوا الهوى أن تعدلوا وإن تلو أو تعرضوا فإن الله كان بما تعملون خبيرا Believers be upholders of justice and bearers of witness to the truth for the sake of God even though it may be either against yourselves or against your parents or your kinsmen and of course by implication or your political party or the rich or the poor for God is more concerned with their well-being than you are and an alternative translation is that God's claim takes precedence over theirs do not then follow your own desires lest you keep away from justice. If you twist or turn away from the truth, know that God is well aware of all that you do. And so this is our prayer and it is our hope for ourselves, for our officials, and for the way that our nation is run. We ask God to accept from us this prayer I say what I have said. I ask God to forgive me and to forgive you and to forgive all of us and guide all of us. Ameen. Ya Rabbal Alameen. Aqam al-Salah.